So we're going to go through uh, step six, which is the null hypothesis test, mostly by hand with a little bit of help from technology. Then we'll compare it with the SPSS output in step seven. In general, you could skip straight to step seven, but this does build the connection between what we've been learning conceptually and, and the actual uh, test results. So the first part is the two hypotheses. Um, and you should go back to your step two for this to see what your research question is. For me, it was, am I getting less than the minimum recommended amount of deep sleep per night? So there's a key uh, word or phrase that you're looking for in this question. And it's, do you have something that says different from? In other words, I could say, am I getting an amount of deep sleep per night that's different from the national average or the average for males my age uh, different from would allow you to reject the null potentially either on the low side of the distribution or on the high side of the distribution so it's what we call a two-tail test and that's going to come into play in a couple different ways here the other possibility is you might have something that says less than or fewer than or higher or more than or uh, faster than or older than if, if there's some kind of directional word here uh, that implies only one of the two tails not both tails then you have a one tail test and uh, the way that our, our book terms that is either a left tailed or a right tailed uh, so in in this particular case um, what I'm really curious is if I'm getting less than the minimum recommended amount uh, deep sleep per night. So that would be left tailed. Less than would be down here. I want to know if I'm uh, the amount I'm getting is is so low uh, that it's less than the minimum recommended. Um, and and by the way, I keep motioning at this this normal distribution. The normal distribution I'm really talking about is is a distribution that's centered around my null hypothesis. In my case, that's 90 minutes. And in the lab instructions, I go through, uh, I give a source where I found this. I surfed around uh, the internet a little bit to try to get a sense of what's the minimum recommended amount of deep sleep for a male of my age. And it seemed like 90 minutes was, was about the minimum. So my null hypothesis, null means nothing, means nothing is going on. Um, nothing strange is going on with my sleep. I'm getting the average amount that I should be. If that's the case, then my population average, in other words, the average of all nights of my sleep, not just the 48 nights that I measured for this study, but this is a parameter. It's talking about my population of all nights of my sleep then that would equal 90 minutes. In reality, it could also equal more than 90 minutes and I, I'd still be getting the minimum recommended amount. Um, but we always, it, it's just cleaner to have an equals in our null hypothesis uh, because it gives us a specific normal distribution to work with for the null hypothesis test. Um, so do make sure that your null hypothesis always has a equal sign there. Then my alternative, like I said, is one-sided. And in particular, um, if I would reject this and say that I'm not getting the minimum amount, then the alternative would be that I'm getting less than, so that the average number of minutes of deep sleep I'm getting would be less than 90 minutes. If in, in step two you decided you had a two-tailed test, your uh, alternative would be mean is not equal to 90. And I just realized that that should be an A for alternative. I had done a little cut and paste and not fixed enough there. So that, that's what it should be. This one should be zero for null, nothing. And this one should be A for alternative. And this one is either going to be a less than sign, a greater than sign, or an equal sign with a line through it, a not equal sign. Uh, part B, we're just going to go with a default level of significance of 0.05. If you're interested sometime, you should read the story of the history of, of how we use this, why we use this as a default. It's somewhat uh, arbitrary, but nevertheless, it has been come to seen as a um, kind of a standard in 
much statistical testing. So just go ahead and use that unless you have some reason particularly not to use it in your in your study. Uh, C, we have these four assumption, assumptions, and you can just uh, copy the assumption itself, the part that's in italics uh, for your, your report, but then you should address it based on your data. Uh, so in my case, I have a ratio level variable. You might have an interval level variable, and, and you could say that. In other words, you don't have a meaningful zero, um, or you might have an ordinal variable so you're not going to quite meet this assumption uh, but you you might be really convinced that 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 ordinal variable you're going to treat it like an interval level variable just because you're pretty sure that it has equal spacing on the data values um, and a little more info on that in the lab report or if you uh, just do some googling on on when ordinal can be considered uh, quantitative my second assumption is the one that I really break down here. Um, you, you really need the data to be representative, the sample to be representative of your entire population. Um, so in my case, I, I can't get a random sample of the nights that I sleep. Um, I suppose what I could do is, is every night, maybe for a year I could flip a coin and if it's heads I collect the data, tails I don't, I get half the nights. It's just it's not really a clean situation for a random sample and and my population isn't even completely clear. Is it every night that I've ever slept going back to childhood? Uh, does it extend out into the future? Uh, so for me, it, it is a fairly representative sample of where I am currently in life. So it, for me, it, it's meeting the assumption well enough to continue with the test. Uh, but in reality, it's, it's not coming from a random sample. So I'm going to have to mention that in my limitations here. I'm going to continue. No matter what happens on your assumptions, go ahead and continue for the purpose of this lab. Uh, but do make sure you address it at the end of the lab when we get to limitations. Uh, assumption three I have no problem with because it's fairly normally distributed, maybe a little right skew. Uh, but even if that right skew is there, my sample size is way above 30. Uh, it's, it's 48. Um, so I'm I'm in no issues with this assumption. And assumption four, it's not really uh, something you need to worry about. In, in general, you don't know the population standard deviation. Uh, you can just uh, copy this but with your whatever context you're you're studying uh, but you're not going to know your your population standard deviation in most cases um, and then the calculation of the test statistic here so this is the formula this is the sample mean the null hypothesis mean the sample standard deviation and then n is the sample size you may see the same formula but on the uh, bottom here Instead of what we have here, you may see something like uh, S with a little X bar. Uh, that's the the sample. Uh, sorry, the standard deviation of the sample means. Um, that boils down to this same fraction here. So either way would be fine. Uh, my sample mean was 77.17. I pulled that from my descriptives. Uh, my null hypothesis mean, here's where we want that exact number, that's why we want that equal sign, so that was 90. Uh, my sample standard deviation, you can also pull from your descriptives, so do be careful you're getting this, if, if you're using, a, for example, a calculator, a, a TI calculator, or some calculator, or Excel or something, uh, there are separate formulas for sample and population standard deviation. So by default, SPSS output gives you sample standard deviation, which is lowercase s, and is what we need right here. And then the sample size, I had 48 data points. And you can uh, either, if you can pull it off your chart there, it says it, um, or you can go back to your original data in SPSS and just see how many rows of data you had. Um, I use these signs, notice, this means approximately equal to. Uh, and the reason I did that is because 
This isn't my exact sample mean, it's a rounded value, same for standard deviation. And then when I take all this and, and do the calculation, it doesn't exactly equal negative 4.76. Um, so because there was just a little bit of rounding involved, we use that sign to be more precise. Um, let me show you real quick just how to type this in. Okay, so we could use parentheses here and do the top, which is 77.17 minus the 90 and write parentheses. And then we're going to divide that by the entire fraction on the bottom. Make sure that this is in parentheses. If you would divide by this and then divide by this, you would get an incorrect answer. So I'm going to put 18.69 and that's going to be divided by the square root of 48. You may need to type the square root symbol before the 48, depending on your calculator. Um, and this would give me There we go, I was gonna say, I forgot to press the equal sign the last time, negative 4.76 uh, would be the approximation. So that's my test statistic T. What does that mean? That means that my sample is 4.76 standard errors um, below the null hypothesis mean. I'm, I'm well below that null hypothesis mean. And, um, it, well, let, let me go through part D and then I'll, I'll show you how that compares. So the degrees of freedom for a one sample t-test is just one less than the sample size. My sample size was 48, uh, so 48 minus 1 gives me 47. Uh, for In your case, you'll take your sample size minus 1 to get this. Do note that this depends on the test we're doing. So in a one sample t-test, we're just subtracting one from the sample size. This does differ depending on what test you're doing, like what we will do in, in lab three. Uh, the critical t-value you can pull from the stat tables that I linked you to. Um, so here you're going to carefully choose your column. Um, I am doing a one-tailed or one-sided alternative hypothesis. So I'm looking at these numbers up here and I'm going to choose the 0 0.05. That was that alpha level of significance from, from part B. Um, if you're doing a two-tail test uh, instead, you're going to want 0 0.05 in two tails and you would be in this column right here. You would have 0.025 in each of your two tails. If you're doing a one-sided in either direction, you should be in this column right here, which is where, where I am. And then notice that this is degrees of freedom. So we are going down here. Um, in my case, I don't have the exact 47 was my degrees of freedom. So I'm somewhere between 45 and 50. I'm going to suggest that we move, if you don't find your exact number here, move up to the next number. So 47 would go up uh, to this 1.679 right here. If you find your exact number, just pull that there. And remember, you are going for degrees of freedom, not sample size. Um, so 1.679 is what I get there. Uh, this is the cutoff value that I'm, I'm comparing with this. So in other words, the only way I could reject was if my, my sample was far enough below that 90 minute average. And mine was 4.76 standard deviations below. As long as I was more than 1.679 standard, uh, standard errors below, um, I would reject that null hypothesis. So I'm well below where I need to be. Um, if you're doing a two-tailed test, your critical t-value will give you the uh, amount of standard errors both below or e above you would need. So you'd either need to be lower than the negative version of this or higher than the positive version. Uh, but since I was just doing a left, left-tailed uh, alternative here, um, I'm, I'm well below the negative version of this. So I would reject my null hypothesis. Uh, anytime you reject the null, it's possible you're making a type one error. If on the other hand, you didn't get, your, your test statistic was not out further than your critical T value, uh, you would fail to reject. And in that case, 
it's possible you would make a type 2 error. So in plain English, uh, I'm probably getting fewer, by rejecting the null, I'm probably getting fewer minutes of deep sleep than recommended per night.